Sadhguru, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today at the World Bank. And I know there are many colleagues who uh, have followed you closely. Um, uh, I have to say, this is a first for me in interviewing a mystic uh, and having a conversation with a mystic. So I'm here to learn um, and to uh, understand uh, more about your philosophy and how your uh, work is helping uh, to achieve a better world. Um, it's great to see so many colleagues here today. Uh, in the World Bank, of course, um, our mission is to help uh, reduce or eliminate poverty in the world and to improve the living standards of the people of the world. Um, and we live in a planet where there is still much to do, and I know uh, your work is also working to that goal as well. Um, I want today to start with where we converge, uh, you know, where we see the world in the same way. And as I've read uh, and listened uh, to, your, to you talking, um, and thanks to the internet, I was able to, to watch you on YouTube, um, you tell us that humanity has the necessary capability and resources to address every problem or almost every problem in the planet, but the only missing element is our willingness. And I think that you work to kindle this willingness within the millions of people who follow uh, you and um, they work to extend their hearts, their heads and their minds to the betterment of humanity. Here at the World Bank, and I know there are colleagues here from the IMF as well, we also work to this goal. Um, and I think by definition, because we work in development, we're all optimists. So I'd like to start by asking um, how we can work to make the world a better place. You're in a room full of economists um, who look at poverty through the lens of numbers, statistics. I always say we can only make a decision if we have a spreadsheet. Um, but can you tell us how you define poverty and what you mean by raising human consciousness and how this can contribute to ending world poverty? Good morning to everyone. <laughs> uh, I think, Anat, it's best that we… this much abused word consciousness, we better define that in some sense. <laughs> so when we… when we look at our experience of life, when we look at individual experience, everything that human beings experience here is coming from what they see, what they hear, what they smell, taste and touch, or in other words, through the five sense organs. Five sense organs in the very nature of things can perceive only that which is physical. You can see only that which is physical, that which is not physical, you cannot see. Similarly, to touch, smell, hear, everything has to be physical. So what is the basis of physicality? Physicality means a defined boundary. If there is no boundary, there is no possibility of physicality. We can call this a physical body because there is a defined boundary. If there was no definition to this, this would not be physical. So everything physical has to have a defined boundary. Entire human experience right now is coming from this defined boundary. Whatever structures you try to create, whatever good intentions you have, once again, it ends up as one… one more boundary, one more division, one more s segment in the world, one more caste or creed in its own way. Every one of these things which have become terrible divisions in humanity, I believe they all started with good intention. I don't think they started with a negative intention, but how many divisions have happened, how we have exploited each other, Talking about poverty, do we have the resource? Well, people are… I mean, if you look at the numbers, you said without a spreadsheet you can't make decisions. If you look at the spreadsheet of the differentiation between what is poor, what is rich in this world, it's obscene to say the least. I'm saying uh, people are saying the amount of money spent on pet food in Europe and America is enough to take care of basic health care for the entire humanity. I mean, it's obscene to say the least. So this has happened not with bad intention, this has all happened with good intention. 
But because human experience is limited to their physical nature, they're trying to think beyond that. But you cannot think beyond your experience. You can think and again you'll end up in another cubicle and another cubicle. So we're talking about consciousness. When we say consciousness, we are talking about a dimension beyond physical nature. When I say dimension beyond physical nature, what is physical to us is all accumulated. This body is an accumula accumulation of the food that we've eaten. What we call as the mind, the content of the mind is something that we accumulated by our impressions and experiences. What you accumulate can only be limited. You cannot accumulate unlimited. You cannot accumulate that which is boundless. So now we are talking about solutions in a boundless way. When we talk about s solving problems seamlessly without thinking who is you and who is me, we need an inner experience which is beyond our physical nature. Only then we will identify beyond this because human mind functions from the identities we have taken. Once we identify ourselves as something, knowingly, unknowingly, we are always trying to protect that identity. So to bring a human being to that dimension of experience, that he or she can function beyond identifications, is what needs to happen. So when we say well-being, from the imperial times, you know, well-being meant uh, taking whatever is there ev everywhere and bringing it to one place and creating well-being in certain people. We kind of evolved out of that, now we are saying well-being means this continent or that continent. Some people, you're a world bank, you're thinking of the entire world, but we're still leaving out a whole lot of things which are part of our well-being. The well-being of every creature on this planet, the well-being of every tree and plant, the well-being of every microorganism is connected with our well-being. This is not ecological awareness, this is consciousness. If your experience of life was beyond the limitations of your physicality, you would just know this by experience. When you know this by experience, you don't have to generate intention, you will just do the right thing. We have to bring the world to that place, that's a long way, but at least we have to bring the leadership in the world to that place. When I say leadership, it is only a question of maybe five thousand people on the planet. You know, when I was at the economic forum, they asked me, Sadhguru, if there's one thing we can do for you which will change the world, what is it? I said, I will name twenty-five people. You give them to me for five days. You will see in three years, you will see a significant change on the planet. They asked, who are these people? I named the twenty-five heads of states of the major nations on the planet. Give them to me for five days, you will see everything will change. <laughs> Because there is money, there is resource, there is technology, only the intent is missing. But the intent is missing not because of bad intentions, not because of some evil in their minds. Intent is missing because there is no larger experience within themselves. Well, th thank you. Um, I guess the, the, the question I have is that, uh, and you know, you work and live in South Asia, um, and I work uh, in South Asia, and this is a region where many groups are left Indian, behind. Indians are feeling very insulted, you're not referring to it as South India <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's another conversation about, <laughs> about the continent. But uh, my, que my, my question is that, you know, we firmly believe that you can't have development unless development actually reaches everybody, that it is development for women and girls, it's development for people of tribes and ethnic groups that are often left behind or marginalized. It's for people of all backgrounds, regardless of their religion, their caste, um, their ethnicity, and so on. So, and this is, a, this is a constant challenge in development, is how we actually ensure that development reaches all of these groups who have been shut out of economic and social opportunity and, and who are unable to seize opportunity on the same terms. What's your thinking on this challenge? See, by law, everybody is equal, at least in India. No, there are countries where by law you're not equal, especially genders are not equal. 
in India, by law you're equal, but by practice it's still not. These are a thousand-year-old problems. They don't get solved overnight. A sustained push has to happen. The problem is of many levels. One thing is the democratic process itself addresses people as religious groups, caste groups, because that is the way to get a bunch of votes. <laughs> so every election, if you have forgotten your caste or religion, when the election comes, they're going to remind you who you are <laughs> I'm saying, that's a reality in which you live. In case you forgot what is your caste and religion, when the election comes, they're clearly reminding you because uh, people have understood the technology of manipulating democracy, the science of how to manipulate democracy. People have understood this number game, how to add up the numbers. It is no more about a big pitch for… to where to take the nation, everybody has understood the science of winning an election, which I think is very dangerous and which I think is one of the most divisive forces that are happening in… in India at least. Otherwise, generally on a day-to-day -day basis, most people don't know what is their caste. Only when they want to get married, they check a little bit. Otherwise, generally they don't know what is their caste, it's not… you're not reminded of that on a daily basis. But when the election comes, you won't be spared, you will be reminded <laughs> So, some fundamentals have to change, though by law it is all equal, in practice there is a difficulty. Definitely we've moved a long way, we've come a long way in the last twenty-five years, a big change has happened. The, those divisions are much less. There are more girls in school today than ever before. Probably there are more girls in school than boys in most of the villages, it is true. Where we are running schools in southern India, generally sixty percent of the students are girls, forty percent are boys because boys like to do other things than studying. They don't always come to the school, but the girls come straight to the school <laughs> So there is a certain a natural studiousness about them or they have figured it out, unless they get educated, they're just going to be rubbished around here and there. They clearly understand that, boys still don't get it <laughs> and probably for them somehow they manage something around. So, how to level this is once again, is a question of the consciousness of the leadership. When I say leadership, it's not just a question of prime minister, chief minister like this, a leadership, the tiers of leadership which are down, they are not in the same mindset. The prime minister may be having a certain thought, the next level of the chief minister's thought is totally different. Down the line to the bottom most leadership which is panchayat is another world by itself. So this disconnect is there. I think right now a serious effort is being made to get everybody on the same pitch with the Prime Minister's uh, vision for the country, a pitch is being made. But being a democracy, election always around the corner, everybody misunderstands this is a political intent. Uh, you don't know whether to make out it… make out of it as a genuine intent or a political intent to win the next election. I feel in a country like India, this may be, uh, create lots of trouble for me, but <laughs> let me say it, in a country like India, I think, we must uh, skip one election, that is not every five years, every ten years. Give them ten years to create something. Because in a nation like India, with the kind of diversity and complexities we have, I think any political leader, to have any fair shot at creating something, he needs at least eight to ten years run. But the fear is always if somebody becomes corrupt, somebody becomes a despot, then you end up for ten years what to do with him. So these problems are there, but these are intrinsic problems to a democratic society. But all said and done, in terms of eliminating caste, creed, religious bias, gender bias, the movement is tremendous. What has happened in the last five years itself is quite tremendous. On the ground is a huge change, but still 
if you don't change rapidly enough, one generation's life may pass, that is the concern. Um, in your work, you work with leaders um, and uh, you said if you, if you had the opportunity to take 25 leaders, we would probably say 187 leaders, I think we have something like that in, in our membership. But it would be helpful to me uh, and others, I think, to understand when you work with leaders in your work, what are you trying to do uh, and how do you do it with, in, in your work with them? See, generally, uh, I find, though there is a lot of opinion all over the place, when you meet most of the leaders, they're well-intentioned, but they're caught up in a mire of <laughs> situations. Democracy is an obligatory game. To climb up there, by the time you reach to the top place, you're obligated to so many people. When you sit there, if you don't take care of all these people, they all think you have betrayed them. If you take care of them, other people think you're corrupt. So this is a very funny game. That's why I said if he has a long enough term, he or she has a long enough term, maybe they could… maybe if they're well-intentioned, they can go without these obligations. But my work with people has been… I've kept little focus on politicians because their term is four to five years. You see in this country, I see election is on for… it's a four-year term. Two years election campaign is going on. See, it's a four-year term for the presidency. Two years election campaign is going on. No, some time limit must be put, three months is enough. Let them prove themselves in three months. Why does it take two years? Every day you watch the news, only election is happening on the news channel. Uh, in India, I thought it's bad, it starts six months ahead. I'm pitching not more than three months, there must be any kind of election work. Let them focus on administration. We elected them to administer, not to fight one more election and one more election forever, okay? So I think somewhere, some limits have to be put because we have celebrated I think moving from dictatorships and monarchies, we kind of little too thrilled with democracy. We need to understand every system has its flaws and democracy has too many loopholes. Only thing is, at least the mistakes are our, ours, you know? <laughs> it's not somebody else's mistakes we suffer, it's our mistakes that we suffer. That is the only satisfaction we have. But yes, we have decided this is the best way to run the world, that's fine. But I think some limits have to be put. You can't run an election for two years. Election campaign cannot go on for two years. There must be a limit, four months, three months is enough. This is costing enormously. This is costing enormously for the lives of common people. And uh, everybody, the entire country is in an election mode for two years, nobody is focusing on what they require to do. So the leadership, as political leadership, I have generally kept away for a variety of reasons, except those we find are visionary in nature. My work has been largely with business leaders and bureaucratic leaders, because these are people who are there for a solid minimum twenty-five to thirty years. These are the people who can make a difference. So about uh, eight years ago, we made a list of two thousand people in India who are business leaders and bureaucratic leaders, who will definitely be there for another twenty-five years in the country doing things that they're doing. They may not be in the news, they may not be up there, these are not photo-op leaders, these are real leaders who are doing work on the ground. So, we made a list of these people and said, if we can bring about at least ten percent change of heart in them, they can change everything in the country. So, we aimed in four years' time, we will get these two thousand people. But now it's eight years or almost nine years now, we have touched about forty-six percent of this leadership. They are quietly making a change for sure. They are everywhere today, in the administration, in the bureaucracy, in the business field. All of them making significant difference in the work that they were… how they were working before and how they are working today, with what intention. My main work has been to shift people from personal ambition to a larger vision. Personal ambition 
is a way of tweaking your desire, you know. <laughs> People keep tweaking it every… every year it gets little more and little more and little more and this is what is destroying the world. Why are you going in installments? Why don't you have a desire, you know? <laughs> it's not by reducing desire the world will get better. You just have to increase your desire. Why are you stingy with your desire? That I have to live well, my ha family have to live well. Why don't you make a real greedy desire? I want everybody in the world to live the way I am. So I'm trying to increase their desire from being personal ambition to a larger vision that we want to do this. So especially for business leaders, see whether you're manufacturing a safety pin or a computer or a spacecraft, it doesn't matter. Fundamental business is human well-being. Somewhere in these spreadsheets – I'm sorry, I'm not referring to your spreadsheets <laughs> – this, uh, you know, what do you call them, the balance sheets of three months balance sheets, these quarterly balance sheets have become paramount goals. You've forgotten. Why we're looking at numbers is just to give us the guidance, how we're going forward or backward. It is not an ultimate God-given thing to anybody. But now these quarterly balance sheets have become the ultimate goals. So generally my work is to move people from this kind of short-term things to a larger vision that be really greedy. If you… if you manufacture safety pin, what should be your thing? All the seven billion people must use my safety pin, the best safety pin, <laughs> okay? Similarly with everything else, I'm saying instead of trying to curtail human aspiration, which is never going to work. It's never going to work. You can try as hard as you want, you can teach whatever philosoph philosophies you want to people, they will all nod today, be content with what you have, tomorrow morning they're on with their own stuff. So it is better to make an all-inclusive aspiration rather than trying to curtail aspiration. Curtailing aspirations have never worked and one of the biggest things that I'm pitching with the political leaders in India and elsewhere also is, we need to curtail human population. That's our only problem, nobody wants to address this. We took charge of certain things, there used to be epidemics, there used to be serious infectious diseases and there used to be a certain number of children dying before they reach four years of age. All these things we took charge. Once we take life into our hands, we must understand that birth is also our business. Once you postpone death, you also must postpone birth, isn't it? The beginning of twentieth century, we were 1.6 billion people. Today, we are nearly 7.2 or 7.3 billion people. In India, in 1947, when we got our independence, we were just uh, 330 million people. Today, we are 1.2 billion people. So four times in sixty-seven years, I think it's irresponsible reproduction. Yes, people are taking pride, we are the youngest nation, we are the youngest nation. So I asked, a minister was talking about how we are the youngest nation. I said, what happened to the old people? He said, what? No, no, we are the youngest nation. I said, fine, what happened to the old people? Nobody got old. That's not a great thing to gloat about. In 1947, the life expectancy of an average Indian was twenty-eight years. Today, it's sixty-four. It's a great thing. People are living longer, but that's becoming our curse because we postpone death, we must also postpone birth, we need to understand this. Otherwise, whatever you do, it's not enough. Whatever you do is not enough, just going on doing more economic development, more economic development is not a solution, it's going to lead to a disaster. See, economic development is fine, but there is only that much world. People are talking about wealth generation. There is no wealth generation. You can only what… take something that is here and put it there, what is there you can put it here. It's the same planet. Today, the living earth statistics tell us that if the entire world has to have what an a average American citizen has, if the seven billion people should have this kind of comforts and convenience and lifestyles, we need four and a half planets, but we have only half a planet left. 
in India, for example, with… Uh, I'm addressing this and we're starting movements to save some rivers now. Uh, a big movement is happening and fortunately, the government is responding very positively. Year on year, year an average of eight percent drop is happening in the river waters in India. So this is approximately sixteen to eighteen years. Most rivers will be gone, they will be just seasonal. Right now the major rivers, people who come from South India, they've been fighting with this river between two states like Kaveri, touches the ocean only five months in a year. Seven months it doesn't reach the ocean. This is true with most of the major rivers. It is not reaching the ocean, it's getting all used up right here. So you do more development, more dams, more people, more food, but there is no more, there is only this much. But we are nice, but we are too many. We don't have to kill the people who are here, but we can postpone the birth, which has to be done. And it's not a God-given duty for everybody to reproduce. There is… if humanity is… human race is in danger, everybody must reproduce, but right now there is no such danger <laughs> Every other creature is in danger. We should tell the tigers to reproduce, elephants to reproduce, humans, slow down <laughs> There are many young people watching this um, and <laughs> I'm sure that's, that's a message that probably has uh, more resonance for them than for me. But, but, uh, but more seriously, uh, we were talking earlier uh, before we came down here uh, about uh, the search that many young people have for identity and meaning in the world and the choices that they make. What message do you have for young people uh, and the role that they can play in making the world a better place? So when you say youth, you're talking about humanity in the making. That means you're not fully conceited yet. <laughs> that means you're not set, you're still an open possibility. So that's a tremendous phase of life. Youth means it comes with enormous energy. Those of you who are young, you don't understand what I'm talking right now <laughs> because youth means it comes with enormous energy. Slowly, it doesn't matter how well you keep yourself, I think I kept myself pretty well, but still, you don't have the same energy. Well, I'm doing better than most youth, but <laughs> but still you don't have the same energy after some time. So this moment of enormous energy is the time when we can make tremendous things happen. But unfortunately, uh, <laughs> your intelligence may get hijacked by the hormones that you can't think straight, it… it just gets entangled into this and that. So this energy largely goes waste in anger, in compulsions of various kind, this and that. If… if only youth invest a little bit in stabilizing themselves, if you bring stability to your way of being, this energy can become a tremendous force. This energy is a real solution to the world for everything, for every problem that you have. The energy that the youth carries, if it had stability, it would become a solution for every problem that we have on the planet because that human energy is needed to make things happen. So as a part of this, we are going into schools. This yoga day, as I was telling you, 18,632 schools across India, we are bringing a simple yogic practice that we are training teachers so that they will sustain it for the children to bring this balance. I'll tell you how this balance is. When we opened our Isha home school of… Uh, you know, a decade ago, one day I went in the morning to the assembly where all the tiny tots were sitting, all seven-year-olds are sitting, they're all <laughs> like this, like this. Then I said, why th these kids have become like this? They're like broken tops. So I just said, twelve minutes a day, we just brought, brought some simple so sounds, seven notes of the Indian classical music. Every day, twelve minutes they do. 
After two months I go, they're all sitting like this. That's all it takes, I'm saying. The simple methodology of what brings stability into a human being, unfortunately is missing in our education systems. Our education system as it is, I mean, to the first question that you asked also, our education system is all about how to exploit everything in the universe. Our idea of science is just this, how to use everything in the world, including human beings. Yes? How to use an invisible atom, how to use an invisible microbe, how to get protein out of bacteria? Why? <laughs> I mean, we are looking at the world as a killing field. We are looking at the world as a way to squeeze it. This is fundamentally because we are in pursuit of happiness. This is the biggest problem. If you pursue happiness, you will endlessly run without ever finding it because it's not out there. Every human experience, joy or misery, both are generated from within us. If you know how to manage this, if your mind and your body took instructions from you, keeping this healthy and joyful would be a natural consequence. Now your body is compulsive, your mind is in a compulsive mode and now you are in pursuit of happiness, this is a mad humanity, just ravaging through the world. The more empowered humanity becomes, the more damage they will cause. Let us admit this much, it's the educated on the planet who have caused the maximum damage to this planet, isn't it so? The uneducated don't cause so much damage. So, our education has not brought sense to us. Our education has not brought life sense to us. It has only given us empowerment as to how to squeeze life out of every damn thing in the universe. So, our mode of education has to change. Fundamentally, how to live, how to manage this one is not there. We know how to manage the entire universe, but we don't know how to manage this. What is it that human beings are struggling with? their thought and their emotion, entire life. They spend an entire lifetime still not knowing how to manage their own thought and their own emotion. Something as simple as, let's say, anger. From the caveman till now, you're getting angry the same way, isn't it? <laughs> There's no high-tech way to get angry. Maybe today if you get angry, you don't pick up a stick, you pick up a nuclear weapon, but <laughs> the same anger, nothing has changed. I'm saying such a simple emotion, we can't handle it. Why? Because we have not… the education systems have not given a moment to the quality of what this is. We are trying to teach discipline, we are trying to teach morality. People know how to subvert those things. Only if you create an inclusive experience, then there is no subversion of that because it is life-enhancing in every way. Every moment, whatever every human being is trying is just this, in some way to expand their experience of life. Somebody may think money will do it, somebody may think wealth will do it, somebody may think knowledge will do it or love will do it. Basically what you're thinking is to be little larger than who you are right now. But if that happens, you want to be little larger than that. If that happens, little larger than that. So you're going in installments towards what? Fundamentally, you want to become boundless. But you're approaching boundlessness or infinite nature in installments. Infinity in installments is a hopeless case. <laughs> it's a hopeless case. Even if you become the king or queen of this planet, it's not going to stop you. Look at the stars, already we are, isn't it? If you conquer five galaxies, you think you will stop. Let's understand the fundamental nature of a human being. We don't know how to manage our minds, but we want to manage thousand people, obviously you will go bonkers. So fundamentally, if your mind took instructions from you, would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? It's a question. Hello? <laughs> blissful, isn't it? So, the fundamental thing is just this, nobody ever taught you from your kindergarten to your PhD how to manage this. So, this is what needs to happen to humanity. 
they must know how to keep their body, how to keep their mind, how to manage this. If you know how to keep this joyful, when you're joyful, let me ask you this question. If I meet you when you're very joyful, I'm sure you're a wonderful human being. <laughs> yes or no? But if I happen to meet you when you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're miserable about something, you're depressed, you could be nasty. Yes or no? This is true with every human being. So we have not taken care of the most fundamental thing, how to… a human being should be within himself or herself. We are leaving it to ethics, morality and fixing the world. You fix the world as much as you want. If you fix it anymore, there will be no planet left. We've fixed it that far already. But still we are in pursuit of happiness. From pursuit of happiness to expression of joy, if you do not shift, there is really no solution for anything. Youth, this is the time to do it. The first thing before you step out into the world is that this must be in a wonderful state. If this steps out in a wonderful state, it will do only wonderful things. When you are feeling wonderful, are you not wonderful to everything around you? That's the only insurance you have <laughs> I'm sure we have time for a few questions. I think we have a question in the front row here. I'm just wondering if we gave you the 25 leaders or the 187 leaders to lock up for five days, when they came out of that room, what are the three things that we would notice about them that would be different? You would notice they would be much more joyful. You can always trust a joyful person, believe me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> because when you're joyful, you will not think of doing anything nasty. That's true with all of you, isn't it? That's true with every human being. But when you're feeling nasty, there's every possibility you will find good reason to do something nasty. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you will find a very good reason to do something nasty. And to be balanced, to be joyful, if these two things happen, the third thing will be a consequence that you will use your body and your mind to the best. There is substantial medical and scientific evidence to show that if you are in a pleasant state of experience, then your intelligence and your physiology functions at its best. There is lots of medical evidence today to show that for twenty-four hours, which has not happened to most human beings. For twenty-four hours if you spend without a moment of anxiety or agitation or irritation or stress or anything, simply blissed out for twenty-four hours. If you stay like this, they say your intellectual capacity would increase almost hundred percent in twenty-four hours' time. So, we could do with little more sense on the planet, for sure, and we could do with little more joy. Annette cannot deliver the 187 leaders, but Annette, you could deliver Jim Kim and his management team, so that's my <laughs> proposal for you. <laughs> no, she's setting the bar. <laughs> she's… Uh, she's setting the bar to an impossible level. <laughs> I'm saying if these twenty-five people come, others will simply follow. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. You were saying um, if you want… if you live… live your life, based on what accumulate in the past, so you can't go beyond, right? So my question is, how can you go… go beyond? See, let's understand what is beyond right now. Right now, your entire experience of life is being gathered through the five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Everything that you know, all judgments that you make is coming from the information that you gathered through five senses. These five senses gather information in a very fragmented way, in the sense, if you see this part of my hand, you cannot see this part of my hand. If I show you this, you can't see this. This is not just with my hand, even with a grain of sand it's true. If you perceive one part, you can't perceive the other. And you know everything only by comparison. When I say comparison, suppose… suppose you were a tall person, that is, you are six feet tall. Now you stand like a tall person, you walk like a tall person, you think like a tall person, you feel like a tall person, you are a tall person. You went to another society where everybody is eight feet tall. Suddenly you stand like a 
short person, walk like a short person, think like a short person, feel like a short person and you are a short person. So what I am saying is, what you perceive in comparison is not perception, it's a distortion of reality. It is good enough for survival in a particular situation, but you don't know anything about anything around you because you perceived everything only as it is relevant to your survival. To such an extent, you do not even know what… what is like light, light and darkness. That's insulting, isn't it? You see an owl, the bird, the owl? If you and an owl sat together and started an argument as to which is light and which is darkness, where would it go? <laughs> Endless argument. I am asking who is right? You or the owl? Who is right? Both, huh? If you're saying both, either you're in the diplomatic core <laughs> or… <laughs> or you have a successful marriage <laughs> You learn to say both, both to everything, otherwise you won't survive <laughs> I am asking which is the truth, which is light, I'm asking. You don't really know, that's a fact of the matter. What you see as light, somebody else is seeing as darkness. What is day for you is night for somebody else, isn't it? And there are more night creatures on this planet. Just if you hold an election and if you make every… if you give everybody a franchise, the night creatures will win hands down because their numbers are huge, all right? So, what I am saying is your sense organs are good enough instruments for survival. But once you come as a human being, survival is not good enough, isn't it? Till it is taken care of, it's a big issue. Once it's taken care of, doesn't mean anything. Because for every other creature, there's only one issue for them. Stomach full, life settled for them. But for a human being, stomach empty, only one problem, food. Stomach full, one hundred problems <laughs> Yes, who has more problems, poor or the rich? The rich have complex problems, poor have only one problem. Food, they truly believe this, this one thing is taken care of, everything is settled. Only when it is settled, they know it is not so because the nature of the human being is like this. For every other creature, their life ends with fulfillment of survival process. For a human being, life begins only after survival process is taken care of. So, what is beyond is in many different ways. The simple thing is this. These five sense organs, because they are survival instruments, the moment you were born, they came awake. You start… you could see, you could hear, you could smell and all this stuff. But anything beyond survival, unless you strive, it will not come into your life. So this striving to know beyond sense perception has not happened to a large segment of humanity because that's been taken out of our education systems. There was a time when that was an important part of growing up in the world. But today we've completely banished that because our entire education system is somehow meshing you into a right shape and size so that you fit into the economic engine. It's a very gross way of running the world. If you… if you're willing to commit thirty hours of focus time, we will give you a vehicle through which you touch something which is beyond sense perception. Thank you so much for a, a truly inspiring talk. Um, I have two quick questions for you. The first one is, according to you, what would be the best school for learning to manage oneself if you had um, three tips per day huh? or per week? You should not go to that school which gives you those three tips <laughs> <laughs> If one feels that there should be harmony in the world, and a lack of inequality, how can we accept that we've strayed so far away? And where can we find some deeper answers to why we're here and what we can do to live with more harmony? First, let me give you a tip <laughs> The fundamental tip is this <clears throat> You know when… can I share something with you? When my girl was growing up, I made one rule around me, nobody should teach her anything. Because the biggest problem in the world is this, the moment you're born, 
every idiot wants to teach you something, <laughs> something that has not worked in their lives. I said, nobody teach her anything, just leave her alone. I just made sure she has enough exposure to nature and life around, but human beings don't teach her anything, any of your tricks she doesn't need. So she grew up very joyfully. When she was around thirteen, she had some whatever, some little emotional stuff and she came to me. And uh, she asked me, you never told me anything, you know, you're always teaching the world, you never told me anything. I said, uh, see, there's only one thing I want to tell you, because I knew her <laughs> current state at that time and I told her just this, this one thing you fix it in your head, never look up to anybody, never look down on anybody, this is all. No looking up to anything, no looking down on anything, just look at everything just the way it is, that's all it takes to make a beautiful life out of this. The problem is you're looking up to something, this means authority has become the truth in your life. Truth will never be the authority in your life. If truth is not the authority in your life, you will never know what this life is about. You may do patchy things here and there. The moment you look up to something, it is inevitable that you will look down on something else. Yes or no? The moment you look up to something, can you avoid looking down on something else? In one stroke, and this will destroy both heaven and hell for you, and you will live on this planet. And when you know you have to live on this planet, you live sensibly. <laughs> because you think you're going somewhere else, you're doing all the rubbish here because you want to go to some other place <laughs> And uh, about harmony, how many human beings or how many of you can really put your heart on your hand and say that if you sit in one place, you're really harmonious within yourself? I want you to understand, the world that you see is a manifestation of what's happening in individual human beings. Because it's magnified, it looks ugly, but it's ugly on small scale too. So, you know, people come to me and tell me, Sadhguru, my husband <sighs> and my mother-in-law, she is beyond everything, my boss, like this, wife, husband, mother-in-law, this person, that person. So I tell them, you come, don't worry. You come in the yoga center, you stay. We will not let your husband, wife, mother-in-law, father-in-law, nobody, just you. I'll give you a nice place to stay, good food to eat. Don't have to do anything, just be joyful, that's all. Anyway, we've prevented all of them from coming, you be joyful. <laughs> Random checks I will make. When I check, you must be joyful <laughs> Otherwise, I don't believe in feeding misery, you know <laughs> Oh, you leave them in one place for twenty-four hours, you must see in how many ways they'll twist themselves. When you're alone, if you're miserable, obviously you're in bad company, isn't it? Hmm? If there is no harmony in this, how do you expect to bring harmony in such a large world. If you can't bring harmony to this mind, if you can't manage this, how do you manage the world efficiently and well? Till human beings, individual human beings work upon themselves, there is really no solution. There is no such thing as global solution. It is individual emancipation which will lead to the world's emancipation. When you and me are doing great, the world is doing great, isn't it? World is just a word, humanity is just a word. You and me are a reality. Without addressing the reality, we are pumping slogans which have no connection with reality. We want to fix the world. Where is the world? It's you and me, right? If you and me are not… don't fix ourselves, then fixing the world is just a popular slogan. At one time, I went to all this… Uh, world peace conferences, I got invited here, there, I thought really something is going to happen. Then I looked in one of these peace committees where about forty-three Nobel laureates were there. I just asked them, because I looked at them, when I looked at their faces I knew, these people have not known peace for a moment in their life 
I just asked them, genuinely tell me, except when you're sleeping, which some of them were doing <laughs> Except when you're sleeping, have you known genuinely what is peace within you? They were sincere enough, they said, no, we don't know. Then don't talk about world peace, sir. there's no such thing. If you and me are peaceful, the world will become peaceful. If you and me are loving, the world will become loving. If you and me are blissful, the world will become blissful. The only problem is human mind. But human mind is the most wonderful gift that we have. I'm saying the best gift that you got, you made a curse out of it. Because you… you've been given a supercomputer, but you not bother to read the user's manual. This is your problem. Yes? You not read the user's manual, how to manage this? And then this intelligence, this is the greatest thing. This cerebral cap capability that the human beings have is the greatest thing that's happened to us. It took millions of years of evolution to get to this place, but now this is a curse. What are you suffering? You are suffering your own intelligence, please know this. Yes or no? If I take away half your brains, most of you would be peaceful. <laughs> yes, harmonious, <laughs> in harmony with everything. So I am saying the best thing that you got, you made the worst out of it because no user's manual. Because your education systems or family systems or the national cultures have no sense about how to manage this one. We are always thinking how to conquer the world. There are two ways you can take the world. You can either conquer the world or you can captivate the world. If you captivate the world, the world will come with you. If you conquer the world, you have to sit on top of it and struggle for the rest of your life. Thank you, Sadhguru. Um, question, um, you talked about working on yourself and meditation comes into it, yet I've seen plenty of meditators that don't seem to act that well. So can you talk about that a bit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not in any way uh, identified with uh, any political nation on the planet, but uh, when I use the names of countries, don't think it's from some prejudice. When anything comes to America, it takes on a different form. It, it just amuses me what forms it takes <laughs> because <coughs> the yoga, for example, what forms it's taken is <laughs> Well, yesterday somebody sent me a WhatsApp message about how they're propagating beer yoga, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so yogis who have drinking problem and drinkers who have yogic problem, <laughs> they do beer yoga, <laughs> okay? Like this there are many <laughs> So we need to understand this, this is not when you say meditation, when you say yoga, this is not an Indian thing or an Eastern thing as it is being understood. This is paying attention to the inner nature of who you are, all right? Fortunately, the fundamentals of being human is same fundamentals, dip doesn't matter which continent you have come from. Though for a long time people have been prejudiced against one against the other, but fundamentally, these creatures are made the same way, this entire species is made the same way, okay? On the surface, uh, maybe I'm made of chocolate and you are white chocolate, whatever, okay <laughs> That's different. So, we need to understand this. For example, you use the word meditation. You must understand this, these words are being thrown around. The word meditation in English doesn't really mean anything specific, it's too general. If somebody sits with their eyes closed, you will say they're meditating. You know with your eyes closed how many things you can do <laughs> Yes or no? <laughs> so in the yogic parlance, you can do japa, tapa, dharana, dhyana, samadhi, you can fantasize about something or you can just master the art of sleeping in vertical postures <laughs> You don't know what you're doing. 
So, what specific aspects are not there? General, because it's a fashion, it is not an endeavor, it is more a fashion, it's an in-thing. You will see people are walking with yoga mat in York City, you ask them what… they say, today is my yoga day, yesterday was my cycling day, tomorrow is my swimming day. This is not like that. The word yoga means union. Union means in some way you learn to obliterate the boundaries of your individuality. Because your individual existence is a fake existence. If you don't understand what I'm saying, close your mouth, hold your nose like this for two minutes, you will understand without the larger atmosphere supporting you, you can't exist for a moment, yes? What you exhale, the trees are inhaling, what the trees exhale, you are inhaling every moment of your life. But this is not there in your experience. Actually, one half of your breathing apparatus are hanging out there. If you experience this, do I have to tell you, don't cut the tree? Do I have to tell you something else like this, to plant the tree? It wouldn't be necessary. If you really experience one half of my lungs is hanging out there, you wouldn't call a tree a wood, isn't it? If I call you flesh, is it an insult or no? So calling a living tree as wood, <laughs> this happened to me. You know, when I was in doing literature, this… we were always studying English poetry and we were introduced to American poetry. So the first day this lady teacher comes and she says, I'm introducing Robert Frost to you and he's a great poet and this, 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 she says so many things. And then she starts off, woods are lovely, dark and deep. I said, stop. I was only nineteen. I said, stop. She said, why? I said, a man who calls a tree a wood, I'm not going to listen to that guy. <laughs> she said, no, no, this is a great poet. I said, I don't care how great he is. A man who calls tree a wood, I'm not going to listen to that guy, I didn't let her teach <laughs> Because this has gotten into our minds. We have not experienced life, we've concluded about everything. We've made conclusions about everything, we've not experienced it. If you sat here and experienced life, very well you would know what the trees exhale, you're inhaling every moment. You can do without any relationship in your life, this one relationship you can't break. Yes or no? We have not br brought human beings to experience. Meditation means this, yoga means this, to bring people to a living experience of life. It's not just the trees and the atmosphere. As you sit here, every subatomic particle is in communication with the rest of the universe. Otherwise, you can't exist here for a moment. This entire fake idea of who you are has to go. That's meditation. So anyway, Technically, what is meditation? Meditation is a consequence, but because these societies have become so goal-oriented, they want the mango, they don't want the tree. If you want flowers in your garden, you don't have to do flower meditation. You don't even have to think flower. You have to think soil, manure, water, sunlight, none of them look like flowers. But if you take care of that, Flower is a consequence, so meditation is a consequence. But people want the consequence, not the process. If you cultivate your body, your mind, your emotion and your energies to a certain level of maturity, you will become meditative. That will be your quality, that will be the fragrance that you will carry with you. But now you want the fragrance, you don't want the process, what will you do? You'll buy some French perfume <laughs> Thank you very, very much. The bank will be very different uh, for having had this experience. So thank you for the time and thank you to the India Club for facilitating this.